good afternoon or good evening, everybody, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to all of you to this session where we will be discussing the, the different evolutions of the system of international relations and the way it reflects, the way it appears uh, within, uh, within the evolutions of the MENA uh, region. So the idea for us will be actually today to try and bring not only uh, different uh, different uh, points of view but also different aspects different angles of course but also different countries and the way they would be shaping their own strategies within the MENA region so the way we will proceed will be the um, the following I will maybe start. So my name is Vara Mikhail. I'm from the St. Louis University, where I had the program of political science and international relations, as well as the Observatory on Contemporary Crisis, that is an observatory focused on some of the important evolutions that we have within international relations within the world. And so the, the, the idea for me will be first maybe to make a general introduction and to bring it together with some aspects related to the way I would say the main major powers, the traditional major powers de developed and develop their own strategies within the MENA region. Bearing in mind that, of course, I'm not the specialist or ch on China or Russia. Uh, Guy Burton and Adnan Mohamedi are the experts. So I will just mention them briefly as part of my general approach to the, uh, to, to the region and the way it's been evolving. Uh, maybe for the sake of the detail, my PhD was about the American policy in the Middle East. So this is where I will be actually using part of it, I would say, maybe to, to mention some some historic, uh, historical points related to, to, to the region. So maybe before I start myself, I would like to introduce uh, to introduce you the co-panelists, the co-speakers that are uh, with me today. So on the one hand, I will do it chronologi chronologi uh, chronologically. Uh, there is Adlan Mohamedi that is here, connecting from Paris, if I'm not mistaken. So Adlan holds a PhD in in geopolitics that he dedicated actually to the Russian foreign policy in the Arab world. He is in charge of research at AESMA, that is a consultancy group that deals with strategic analysis and geopolitics. He is also a researcher at the U. MR Prodig or UMR Prodig, Prodig in French, which is a research center uh, on geography, also based in Paris. And among his many activities, he is also a columnist for uh, Middle East Eye, that is this well known reference, I would say, to all of us that work on the MENA region. Uh, so thanks for being with us, uh, Adeline. Uh, uh, next to you, Guy Burton. So Guy is from the Vesalius College. Brussels School of Governance. Um, he is an adjunct professor at the Brussels School of Governance and a fellow on the sectarianism proxies and desectarianization project at the Lancaster University, which is something that actually is totally, I mean, I can see here the key words that are related also to all what the, the MENA researchers follow generally uh, in, the, in the MENA region. So Guy has previously held research and teaching positions at the Mohammed bin Rashid School of Government based in Dubai, uh, at Nottingham University's Malaysian campus, and the University of Kurdistan Huler in Iraq, without forgetting this also well known Birzeit University uh, in Palestine. So Guy, your research uh, interest covers the politics and international relations of the Middle East with a particular focus on the role of rising powers and within what will be of interest also for us uh, today, uh, the, your focus of course on China and the Middle East. Uh, so I will, I will try to be as brief as possible. Usually I promise to be and I'm a bit longer, but no, I will stick to, uh, to, to the, the time that I promised to stick uh, to by maybe just starting and talking about some of the aspects related to, uh, to, to the system of international relations and the way it evolves, but also maybe to the US role within the MENA region and how something is changing, I would say, uh, there. So what do I mean, do I mean by that? First, uh, I think that it's quite obvious that the MENA region, what we understand as being the MENA region, uh, has always had something to do with the system of international relations. I mean, 
we won't go, we don't have to go back to the Crusades and the fight over Jerusalem. Uh, we don't have to go back necessarily to the Ottoman Empire and the fact that the Ottoman Empire was the target actually to, 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 to the strategies that were developed by countries that were interested into weakening, if not dismantling the Ottoman Empire. I mean, we could go to all of these examples. We could also think of Lebanon um, in the first half of the 19th century and the fact that the French were backing the Maronites and then the, the, the Russians were backing the Druzes and so on and so forth. I mean, there's been always this kind of proxy positioning for many international powers through the evolutions of the Middle East. We have these examples and then bringing it closer to us, we have the Wilson points in January 1918 that mentioned the right of people to self-determination that headed the, or paved the way uh, towards having the period of the mandates. And this same period of time happened to coincide with the fact that we still had an imperial France and an imperial Britain that still had to take into consideration the, U, the American saying because the, American, the Americans made the difference when it comes to World War I. But based on this, they still developed mandates within the League of Nations, I would say, trying still to implement the, uh, the, the power that they had, trying to actually give a continuity to the notion of imperialism by saying, okay, we have a mandate, we're gonna give you your independence. Actually, we never want, we're not willing to give your independence, we're acting as if we were going to do. No. Taking it, and I really want to get to what we are witnessing today, so this is why I'll, I'll move forward uh, quicker on this, but I mean, on his way back from Yalta, the Yalta conference in 1945, Roosevelt stopped in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and out of this step or this uh, stop in Saudi Arabia, would happen, what would be dealt with would be the Quincy Agreement or the Quincy Pact that would definitely shape part of the evolutions of the MENA region that would also pave the way to having a strong US positioning within the MENA region. Uh, 11 years after the Swiss crisis, that definitely was the last nail in the coffin of the French and British imperial powers. This happened in Egypt, of course. So still, we have here, and also, I mean, the, the interesting thing was that the US and Russia agreed there on some, the US and the USSR at that time agreed there, despite being rivals, on the fact that they wanted to squeeze out these two uh, major powers. We jump in history. The Gulf War 1991 happened two years after the, the fall of the wall of Berlin, and this is where the new, world or, um, the new world order was announced, but it was announced based on Kuwait and Iraq and evolutions in the MENA region. 12 years after post 9-11 context, Afghanistan, of course, but Iraq too in 2003. So 2001, 2003, strong US positioning in the MENA region. The US has built its capacities being a superpower all through the 90s. In 2001, it wants to prove that definitely it is this superpower. So all of this is about the Middle East. And then we get to what we are witnessing today. The, I would say the wave that follows the Arab Spring, what the Arab Spring revealed and how things have been evolving afterwards. And this is where I think that all through the 10 years we've had evolutions that definitely were evolutions within the MENA region that had an impact over the MENA region, but at the, at the same time that reflected on the way the system of international relations had been evolving. What do I mean there? I mean that since the beginning, since 2011, since the beginning of the Arab Spring, everybody or many observers expected that the US would be the leading uh, power, the leading actor within these, within these evolutions. Of course, conspiracy theory was quick to come there. The fact that some saw the hidden hand of the US between the, 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 the overthrowing of Ben Ali in Tunisia, of Mubarak in Egypt, uh, while others were saying, no, they're not so comfortable getting rid of their allies. I mean, it was confusion no but i mean i'm not i i don't want to develop this i just want to look more at the way the us had been positioning itself towards the mena region before 2011 and after 2011 and the fact is that the arab spring coincided with the obama administration but it coincided with an administration that was there also to fix maybe some of the damage that had been provoked by the bush administration before 
this is where I think that what has been interesting in the positioning of the of the Obama administration, I remember this op-ed that I think was published by the New York Times somewhere around 2014-2015, where an author was saying people accuse of Obama of not intervening in Syria, saying that he is a bad leader and he is weak. And this author was saying it is rather the contrary. That's because he is a good leader and he's aware of challenges that he prefers not to step in Syria. I mean, this is interesting from my point of view because, yeah, we expect the U.S. to be the strong hands, to be the aggressive power, because we've been we've been used to be to seeing that, be it under Reagan or uh, or Bush father or Clinton or uh, or Bush of uh, Bush Jr. I mean, we've seen definitely when the U.S. wanted to intervene, it intervened. And what happened so far? What happened there was that no, with the Obama administration, uh, we saw that depending on the files be it under the under the Clinton, uh, when Hillary Clinton was a state secretary, a secretary of state, or when she was followed by John Kerry. In both cases, we, we've seen that when, where, when we were, when the US was dealing with files that I would say were not so sensitive or when things would could wouldn't change so much it was the the state depart the the state department that was leading things when it was more about sensitive issues where the us did not want so much confrontation wanted to be cautious the white house put its hands on the file and for instance i'm thinking of syria here where obama decided that he would be the one that would be dealing with this um, with this file so within all of this where do we get then within the arab spring i think that we got to this position where what we saw was that there were no powers that wanted confrontation with uh, with the US. And I remember this, um, I think it was in 2016, it was right before the US elections where Putin was asked about his perception of the US and their role. And I remember that, um, I mean, quoting him my way, what he was saying anyway was that the US was still the superpower and that the US was still the power that was making the difference. And there is something uh, strong, and there is still something left of it, of course, I think, the US supremacy somehow, the, the fact that the US makes the difference, definitely. But at the same time, the fact is that when the US decided to, uh, to, to step back from some situations, what strikes me, the fact that this is where we had some powers that tried to jump in and to, to fill in the void that had been uh, left by the, by the US. And I think that this reveals two things actually. One, the fact that nobody wants really a confrontation still with the US. So if the US considers that it has a kind of sphere of influence, then the other powers, and of course, I'm thinking of China and Russia, but not only, I'm thinking also of France, I'm thinking of Britain, I'm thinking of Italy, that want to have a grab on something within the evolutions of the MENA region. Well, what you can see is that nobody wants confrontation, nobody with save one exception that I won't mention or two that I won't mention afterwards, but in general, the traditional powers that have developed influence in the MENA region want still to develop influence without really uh, opt opting for uh, or choosing confrontation with the US. And so there, this is where we have this questioning, this wondering about what is it that the US wants really? Does it want to remain a leading power in the MENA region? Or does it want to step back because it has enough issues to deal with when it comes to the to its do domestic issues? I think that one, one very interesting article that is um, that did not get as known as the clash of civilizations, but it is also another article by Samuel Huntington when he talked about what he called the Hispanic challenge. I think there is something definitely key in it. Does the US have to focus on its domestic issues and the price of it, uh, will the price for this be its withdrawal from the rest of the world? Basically, there is this key question that is there. You have another author, Jacques Attali, that had said like 15 years ago, what he saw is that from his point of view, maybe the US, yeah, would withdraw from the world's affairs because it would have to focus on its domestic issues if it does not want to have its identity dissolved in something in a new reality. Uh, so all of this, this has to be taken into consideration and of course one has to assess things and to see whether things are true or not or to, to take things with uh, I would say with distance and with keeping actually uh, keeping aware of the fact that 
historical sequences do not shift overnight. Despite the acceleration of events at the international level, I think that we still have long sequences that are there. But maybe one key question that remains in the mind of the Americans is the one related to the, the, the average trajectory that we have for empires taken in a traditional way and what is happening with the US because political science and history of international relations teaches us that the average age for a traditional empire is more or less 250 years of age. Uh, the US is at the beginning somehow of its really domination, I would say, of the world's perspective. So. Here, I would say that there is definitely uh, a key question that's honestly, I don't have the answer to, but a key question about uh, the US and the way it looks at the world's perspectives. So from here also to the fact that I think that there are new tendencies that are appearing in the MENA region that also have to be taken into account because they take us, they open the way or they open the, 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 the path to new realities. What do I mean here? We've had the bipolarity during the Cold War, the US and the USSR, where that were the major powers. And then it's been followed by this unilateral sequence in the world of international relations, where the US was definitely the dominating power. And it was either states uh, stand or side with the US or try and side against the US, but without having the USSR to, to, to hang on to. You know? So there was this this definitely face of history where it was quite clear that the US was the only strong and challenged actor. And I remember conferences that I used to, that, that, that I assisted to right after 9-11, so around 20 years ago, where you had really big specialists, known specialists of international relations that were, uh, that were saying that there is no point in questioning the supremacy, not only the supremacy of the US, but also its future, because the US had accumulated a military power that went beyond what the Roman Empire itself had acquired, but brought it to relative terms, of course. So, there was definitely this thought that Fukuyama would have it right, would have had it right when it comes to saying it is the end of history and it will be a world that will be actually, that would reveal the manifest destiny of the US in modern terms, no, the democracy, the liberalism, etc. All of this, no. But the, so there's been this, and then there is another reality that is emerging, which is my point in what I want to say now, the fact that we are witnessing the rise of non-Arab actors within the MENA region with new regional actors that are making the difference. And the ones that I have in mind here are Iran and Turkey. They are new actors that have emerged over the 20 last years because of circumstances and because also of preconceived plans, I would say. So briefly, what do I mean by that? I, said that, I think that Iran did not have an outreach in the MENA region up to 9-11. It had a strong alliance with Syria that went back to 1980 in the wave, in the aftermath of the Islamic revolution. But beyond that, it was like we had Iran and we had the MENA region and the links were not so much there. We had the obsession of many Arab countries about having the Iranians exporting their revolution to the MENA region. This obsession about the fact that the Shiites of the MENA region could be bought somehow by Iran, but it did not really when it comes to talking about deeds, honestly, I think that many things have been exaggerated there. So the anti-Iranian obsession was building on maybe a part of reality, but a lot of speculation too. Anyway, what happened after 9-11 is that I think that the US served Iran by making, giving it two huge gifts, actually. One, overthrowing of the Taliban, which were the among Iran's fiercest enemies at their border, and two, the overthrow, uh, overthrowing of this other actor that was also annoying for Iran despite his weakness, and that was Saddam Hussein in Iraq. So you have the eastern and the western borders of Iran that happen to be open to their influence. And I think that here, yeah, the US gave the keys to having the Iranians develop some influence. This combined with the situation in Syria. 
Syria, of course, there was a political alliance before. There was a selling, uh, the sending of weapons and ammunition and capacities by Iran to Syria in order for it to get to the Lebanese Hezbollah in Lebanon. But with the Syria war, I mean, it is quite clear, and some 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 officials uh, in Iran. Uh, say it or said it, uh, though they don't say it publicly, I mean, but the, the point was clear for them. Uh, they did not like Bashar al-Assad so much in Syria. They never really trusted him, but then they looked at the alternative and the alternative was uh, somewhere between a pro-American and pro-Muslim brotherhood option that would be against them anyway. So this is where they decided that no, it is worth saving the Syrian regime. And so this got them to develop influence in Syria. And from here to these other non-Arab actors that have been rising in the MENA region, and it is Turkey. I think Turkey that had preconceived plans when it comes to having its capacities developed in the MENA region. Uh, there was the ante uh, Arab Spring situation where we tried to develop economic to develop economic relations, diplomatic relations. That's the AKP, the current still uh, ruling party, uh, and some things happened, meaning that there were def definitely a, a new. There was a kind of new phase of history that opened between Turkey and the MENA region, and I think that also Turkey had in mind that the fact for it to be the facilitator and the good actor within the MENA region would get it also to be to to be to have more to have more accessibility to the EU, meaning that the EU would need an actor to be the, inter the inter intermediation between them and the, the, their will to act more within the MENA region. But with 9-11, just remember what happened in Libya, uh, with 9-11, sorry, with 2011 and the Arab Spring, remember what happened in Libya. Uh, Gaddafi had left Tripoli. He had not been found yet, but still you had this rivalry between the people that wanted to appear on the pictures uh, on the picture as the liberators of Libya. And that was, if you go back to 2011, I believe it was June or July 2011, if I'm not mistaken, well, you had on the one hand Erdogan preparing his trip to Libya, and on the other hand, Sarkozy and Cameron and, uh, and Berlusconi at that time that were rushing to also be the first to arrive to, uh, to, to, triple, uh, to, to Libya and to appear on the picture as the people that liberated uh, Libya. What I mean here is that Turkey was interested already into having a major role, and Turkey is still interested. And be it in Libya or be it in Syria, it is playing, uh, it is trying to play a dominant role. So from here to actually heading to the conclusion, going through something that relates to what we could try and anticipate in the evolutions. I mean, honestly. Uh, it's hard to, to know how things will evolve. It's hard to know how the system of international relations will evolve and how it will reflect in the evolutions of the MENA region and vice versa. But at the same time, I think that what sounds clear is the fact that the US will have has and will have to deal with other powers in the MENA region, meaning that the, the era of domination i think is behind us but at the same time something is in the making the question is what is it exactly that is in the making and this is also where adlen and Guy, of course will give us their hints and their clues and the keys about about what is it really, really that could sound as being in the making and what is it that we could be heading towards in the um, in the future but what i want to point out here is that what i can notice from the biden administration is that it is a, an administration that under the appearances of ideology is playing confrontation actually it is going back to these to what we have known by the us as being the us that wants to be sure of itself and that wants to just play confrontation to prove that it is the one that has that that, that is right and the one that has the capacities and the one can uh, the one that can shape evolutions and make evolutions uh, make uh, evolutions being determined in a way or another but the thing is that i am not sure that the us is anymore in a capacity to keep it that way because things have changed because the US in 2004, I remember this conference that I assisted, assisted to where you had a US representative and ambassador also, uh, an ambassador by the way, that was saying, we are a bit angry at some countries that include Saudi Arabia, because what, what we can see is that when the king of Saudi Arabia goes to China, he goes there with a delegation of diplomats that happen to be fluent in Chinese, and we did not see it coming. So of course, 
there is the anticipation of things because the relation with the US has been based on the fact that we want protection, we want diplomatic backing and we want military protection. And what we can see is that there are other actors that could maybe be more in continuity with what we want ideologically or politically than what the US may want because things change and trust as we know is not the main criteria uh, that, that prevails in international, in international relations. This is why I think that all of this has to be taken into account. And what has to be taken into account too is the fact that we're used to having Iran confronting the US at least um, uh, verbally, but we're less used to having Turkey confronting not only the US, but also being this kind of black sheep within the NATO, within NATO that does whatever it wants because it is favoring its own prospects. And because it is saying, you know what, we have the Russians and we have we're also dealing up to a certain extent with Iran, which are the ones that you don't like. No. So all of this, I think, are indications about the fact that definitely there is something moving, there is something changing. It does not mean that the US era is behind us. But at the same time, uh, I think that what Putin, what I was referring to when Putin was saying some five years ago that the US is a superpower remains true. But the fact is that there are some challenges also that are there. Uh, thing, for example, and this will be my last word here, this thing, for example, as the, uh, as the way uh, the US launched, that ant launched an anti-Daesh coalition in 2014 and Russia decided to do the same one year after exactly, those are indications uh, of the fact that definitely the unchallenged US is not unchallenged anymore. So this is it for, for, for me, actually. So what I suggest without transition is that maybe Adlen, you could take it from, from here um, and lead it to the points that you want to make, including, of course, the, the role yeah. and the interest of Russia for the MENA region. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bara, um, and, and thank you to, to, the Mid to the Middle East Dialogue team for inviting me and um, giving me the opportunity to summarize my ideas on uh, Russian policy in, uh, in the region. And uh, it's very tempting, actually, to compare your introduction on the US with uh, the questions one could ask um, on Russia, because uh, there are many analogous questions we can ask on Russian identity, for example, because one of the main questions uh, uh, Russia is dealing with uh, is whether it's an empire or a nation, for example. And 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 uh, and uh, when when you see the Russian government try to um, to influence, for instance, uh, some partners. Uh, through the idea of national sovereignty rather than uh, imperialism. I mean, the most obvious conclusion is that difference is, uh, is far from being obvious, actually. Uh, so as a quick historical reminder, uh, let's remember that post-Soviet Russia, Russia's interest in the Middle East should not be associated with, uh, with Vladimir Putin's arrival in power for two reasons. Uh, firstly, because because he has inherited uh, Soviet policies, but also those of the 90s, and especially these debates and the debate on Russian identity, for example. And for example, the leading role played by Yevgeny Primakov, an Orientalist um, who was minister and then a prime minister between 1996 and, and 99, and who advised Putin during uh, his first years. Uh, secondly, because he himself was a bit slow to show interest in North Africa and the Middle East. It was not until his second term that he started the Russian uh, diplomatic offensive in the region. And, uh, for example, he was absent from the funeral of Hafez al-Assad, um, uh, despite, despite the, uh, the very close ties between uh, the former Syrian president and, uh, and Moscow. Uh, I mean, you, you certainly remember that during the first years of his first term, he was rather focused on Europe and the US rather than uh, on the Middle East. So here I try to focus on uh, the last 10 years, of course, uh, since the Arab Spring and the evolution of the Russian position in the region in 10 years. So two major turning points, um, obvious turning points, the beginning of the uprisings, 2011, and the direct entry into the war in uh, 2015. First point, uh, Russia and, and the, um, the uprising in the Arab world. So with the uprisings in the Arab world, three uh, axes or three alliances were expressed 
uh, in the Arab world. So the so-called resistance axis you mentioned with uh, Iran, Hezbollah and, and Damascus, a counter-revolutionary axis, and uh, let's call it an Islamist reformist axis with, with Turkey and, uh, and Qatar. Uh, the Russian position on the Arab Spring was more, was very similar to, 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 to um, that of the counter-revolutionary axis. I mean, it, it was uh, a mix of skepticism and concern. Uh, and after what was perceived as a betrayal in Libya, a military intervention considered by Russia as contrary to international law because, because it went beyond the UN resolution I mean, uh, in, in March 2011, uh, we saw I mean, a stiffening of the Russian position in Syria. And in Syria, uh, Russia was an important partner of the axis of resistance and found itself confronted with the other two, the Islamist reformist axis, uh, represented by Turkey and Qatar, which seemed to want to promote the Muslim Brotherhood, as you mentioned, and the counter-revolutionary axis led by Saudi Arabia, which wanted, uh, rather wanted actually to curb or to, to contain Iranian influence in the, in the region. Uh, this stiffening and more generally the Russian uh, hostility towards the, uh, the Arab Spring associated with two despised elements uh, uh, I mean, according to Russia, I mean, transnational political Islam uh, experienced twice beyond its borders in Afghanistan and within its borders in Chechnya, and uh, the so-called Western interference. I mean, these two despised elements, despised by Moscow, I mean, could have led to, to fears of a Russian uh, estrangement from the Arab world, similar to the one that came with the fall of the USSR. And I think that... Uh, the, the, the Russian diplomats were a bit worried uh, in the first years. But the decisive military intervention uh, helping the Syrian regime has finally made Russia an essential partner rather than an adversary. And I think that this is a major point because uh, between, I mean, 2012, 2013, uh, the, even the Qatari diplomats actually were very hostile to, 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 toward Moscow. And after the uh, 2015 intervention and some decisive victories, uh, the main uh, discourse, even, even among the, um, the, um, the Gulf countries, uh, clearly changed, actually. So uh, the second major point after this, uh, this Russian view on the Arab Spring is the evolution of the Russian position since 2011 uh, between, between bias and refusal of uh, binding alliances. I mean, bias at the beginning and then refusal, a clear and, and, and obvious refusal of binding alliances uh, afterwards. After military victory achieved alongside uh, the axis of resistance, Russia engaged in dialogue with, uh, with, the, uh, with the other two with the counter-revolutionary axis with which it shares the same mistrust uh, toward the uprisings and the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, relations are very good and they are excellent actually with the Emirates, uh, with which Russia has a real strategic partnership. And uh, one should not forget that it is not the case with Syria and Iran. Uh, and moreover, Moscow, I mean, counts on Abu Dhabi, which uh, reopened its embassy in Damascus at the end of 2018 to contribute to the reconstruction of the country. And I think that it relies rather on, uh, on the Gulf countries uh, than on China, for example. With Turkey, there is no question of an, of an alliance, of course, but a central dialogue. Militarily, Russia, I mean, very cynically, one could say, uh, used Kurdish fighters, especially in 2016, to push Turkey to give up efforts to topple the Syrian regime uh, before using, and it is still the case today, uh, the threat of a Turkish military intervention to push Kurdish fighters to definitively join the loyalist camp. And I think that it is um, one of the main, um, I mean, components of the Russian strategy in Syria. Politically, and knowing Turkey's uh, power of nuisance in Syria, the Astana process has been very useful for Russia. However, it can be said that up to now, um, 
Russia has insisted much more on the need to rebuild the country than on the political process. I mean, the pressure on the Syrian leadership has been uh, more on security structures uh, some ministers, for example, than on political institutions. When, 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 when you look at the, uh, the so-called constitutional committee, I mean, it, 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 it looks today um, like a deadlock, actually. Uh, however, with the election of Joe Biden that you mentioned uh, uh, earlier, which is, of course, the bad option uh, for Moscow, and the fear of an increased US role in Syria, Russia has every interest in maintaining dialogue with Turkey and pursuing the political process, uh, because it's, I think it's the only way to protect itself from possible US initiatives. Uh, I mean, uh, the Russians is, do not want more support from Washington to the SDF, and especially the, the, um, the, y, the, YPG, the, the YPG fighters, the Kurdish fighters, because, uh, U.S. support uh, is likely to dissuade them from converging with Damascus, and converging with Damascus is ultimately uh, Moscow's goal in, uh, um, in Syria. So it can be said that Russia first used the axis of resistance to win militarily in Syria, but politically, it especially needs the other two, yeah, and in particular Turkey. By participating recently, for instance, in a, a tripartite meeting with Qatar and Turkey, a sort of reverse Astana, uh, Russia is sparing actually the latter, is sparing Turkey. And it is also sparing Turkey by preventing Damascus from conducting a new military offensive in Idlib. And the relate the, this, 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 um, relation, the, the relation between Ankara and Moscow, I think it's, it's central today. Because, uh, because, because according to Moscow, it is the only way actually to avoid a new, um, a, a new, a new um, escalation. So third point I, I wanted to mention uh, today was the, um, the relations between Russia and North Africa, and, and especially the Algerian and Libyan cases. So I will try to be brief on, on, on these, two, these two countries. In Libya first, Let's recall that Russia has discreetly broken with its doctrine of privileging the political powers in place. Uh, I mean, in, in Syria, the, the Russian argument is, is obvious. Uh, Assad represents the, the, um, somehow the legal power. But this argument doesn't work in Libya because, um, because even if they did it discreetly, everybody knows today that if they did it uh, through, uh, through through the, uh, their mercenaries, but we all we all know that they they support them. They supported um, uh, Haftar, and and they did it, uh, and they and they're still. I mean, uh, they they don't admit it, but I think that it's um, it was uh, it it was it was justified. It was not legally justified, but politically, ideologically justified, because they considered that it was like in Syria. Uh, like in Syria, a good tool against in their so-called war on terror or their war against terrorism in Libya. But that said, Russia has decided actually to multiply its uh, interlocutors. In addition to Haftar, they, 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 they relied on the Qadhafi networks and they also maintained a dialogue with the legal government in Tripoli. So here again, uh, the Russian-Turkish dialogue seems decisive, and this time the, the invocation of legality is on Turkish side, of course. But each actor knows the red lines uh, of the other, and there is no question, I think, of sacrificing the bilateral relations, uh, uh, because I think that they both know that, that uh, their bilateral relations are somehow more important uh, than their interests in Libya uh, or in Syria. And uh, regarding Algeria, with which Russia has close relations dating back to, to, to the 60s, I think that three observations could be made. The first one, uh, in the face of the political uprising, uh, the Herat, Russian support was finally limited. I mean, um, Russian media, for example, some Russian media, uh, 
criticized the Algerian regime and they were allowed to, to do so. And, and, and this, is, uh, this is interesting. Uh, the Algerian regime was more supported by France, in fact, uh, than uh, by Russia. The Russians seem to consider that the primacy of military power in Algeria means that Algerian dependence on Russia and especially on Russian arms uh, is not threatened by this movement. And I think that because they are, uh, I mean, uh, well informed and they know that the, uh, the argument of interference doesn't work in the Algerian case, of course. Uh, second observation, um, of Algeria is the third client of the Russian military industry, and uh, Algeria continues to buy a lot of, of, of weapons, of Russian weapons. Uh, why? Of course, because of the regional context, by also because uh, of the uh, balance of power with Morocco. Uh, third observation on the Russian-Algerian relations, and, and it doesn't really concern Russia here, because they, they, they show the weakness that characterizes the Algerian economy. Uh, we know that, for example, it, 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 I think that this one is very interesting. You can note that uh, its two neighbors, I mean, uh, Algeria's neighbors, I mean, Tunisia and Morocco, managed to export much more uh, to Russia uh, um, th than Algeria. And, and, and this is very interesting because uh, the, uh, the, the relation between Algeria and Russia is, uh, I mean, is, um, Yes, I mean it, it reflects uh, the uh, somehow um, the the, uh, the the weakness of Algerian economy. Uh, to conclude, uh, if I'm not, I think I, if I'm not too brief. To conclude, I, I'd like to say that Russia, I think that Russia wants to to be able to dialogue with all actors in the region, and it is new. Uh, because 10 years ago, it wasn't the case at all. 10 years ago, uh, it was uh, Russia had, uh, had allies and, 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 and enemies, and it's not the case today. That's an interesting evolution. Uh, there is no question of sacrificing any relationship for another. And, 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 and I think that this point is very central to Russia. Uh, and its relationship with Israel and the axis of resistance is a good example because it supports the resistance, this axis of resistance against the rebels in Syria, but certainly not against Israel. And this position, this particular position, I think makes Russia uh, the power with the greatest interest in de-escalation. Because in case of escalation, it will, I mean, it will have to choose. So it will have to sacrifice some uh, partnerships. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Adlen, for a fascinating overview and for putting some rationalization, I would say, in this Russian its approach to the MENA region, which is not always the case from what you hear also, you know, about Russia and its role and its intentions. And so, well, from here to this other main actor in the region, or so-called main actor in the region, uh, China, and all what relates to its strategy also in the MENA region. So we hear a lot about the fact that the economy would be more uh, more developed, I would say the economic track would be more developed than other tracks such as the diplomatic or such as the um, as the military one. But is it true? Do we have to take distance with this? With a to look at it with a pinch of salt? Well, Guy, please, the floor is yours to allow us also to understand better what is the role of China in the MENA region. Well, thank thank you, Bara, and thank you, Adeline, for you know for for the very interesting presentations. And also, I would like to thank the Middle East Dialogue for allowing me to uh, participate in this in this panel this 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 week. Well, basically this evening here in Brussels. Um, so some great presentations, and 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 that's kind of teed me up very nicely to talk about China and the Middle East. Um, and I've got some, I guess, some headline points to make and then sort of go, you know, dive into it in a little bit more detail. Um, I know that, you know, China and the Middle East has become a real buzz industry. There's a lot of interest, a lot of attention, you know, in, in recent years. Um, and a lot of it obviously is captured by, you know, the presence of the existence of the Belt and Road Initiative. And what does that mean for the Middle East? And does that mean that China is going to become a more major power in the region? Um, you know, I would like to sort of maybe take a step back from that. And so if you don't mind, and if you'll excuse me, Barrow, you know, I just want to sort of plug my book, which came out last year, 
um, we, in which I provide a more historical context to China and the Middle East um, to try and sort of situate what, what is happening in China today, uh, sorry, what is happening with China in the Middle East today with what's happened in the past. And in that, you start to realize that actually China is not the new actor that is often sometimes portrayed, that China does have a history in the Middle East that goes back, you know, at least 70 years to the 1950s. But before I start with that, I just want to sort of say, you know, a couple of main points. First of all, you know, keep in mind, even though China is becoming a major economic power, it has a presence and influence around the world. You know, the Middle East itself is more of a secondary uh, area of concern for China. So if you think about, you know, if you imagine, and this is probably the case for most countries, if you imagine, you know, sort of concentric circles around in, in, in terms of geographic space, you know, the priority for China is still primarily, you know, the mainland in the periphery in the mainland, so places like Xinjiang, Taiwan, Hong Kong, um, they are more concerned with what goes on there. And then I guess close to nearby to that, the near abroad, so the South China Sea, Central Asia, relations with Russia to the north, relation, you know, relations with, with Japan to the east, India to the south. So, you know, keep in mind that the Middle East is a bit more of a peripheral uh, 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 site for, 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 for China than maybe, you know, other parts of the world are. Also keep in mind that in the context of, you know, the current, you know, upheaval that exists in the Middle East, especially in the, in the post-2011 uh, Arab, Arab uprisings, we are living in a state of flux. We're living in, a, in an environment in which there are a number of regional uh, powers who are all competing with each other, um, with no, no established clear alliances, but you know, cooperating. And some, some of them are cooperating together, some of them are competing with each other. Uh, and obviously China has to navigate that. And so China has taken the approach of uh, what's called strategic hedging to avoid taking a position. And that enables it to be in a position where it can actually be working both with Saudi Arabia and with Iran at the same time and building relations and looking to develop economic exchange with them and without and without that spilling over into any kind of you know, political commitments. Um, and actually to that, I also want to add the point because you know, Barrow was talking about, um, you know, uh, the, is, you know, would, is, is China, I think you were leading towards this, Barra, you know, could China actually be, uh, you know, in a position to replace the United States in the Middle East? Uh, you're arguing that, no, there's a lot of other actors, you know, that, that are competing there. Um, I think one of the important things that we sometimes miss, especially for those, you know, and I think this is a big problem in the Washington at the moment. If you look at what comes out of the think tanks or comes out of the commentariat in Washington, there is this obsession with, we must pivot away from the Middle East to the to the to the east to East Asia, and then the question then comes: Well, what happens if we leave the Middle East behind? China is going to sweep in and take over, you know, the region. I think that is actually overstating things. Um, it's actually the case that China does not want to replace the United States as the security provider or guarantor in the region. Certainly not for now. It has done very well, you know, um, out of the current, you know, it has done very well. Um, you know, within the context of what, is, what, what has existed until now. Give you a classic example, 2003, you know, America went in, invaded Iraq, you know, completely leveled the country and transformed it. But who's actually benefited from it economically? The Chinese. And they have not had to put up any kind of, you know, investment in terms of political or military uh, security assistance in that respect. So much, so much so that in around 2014, 2015, I recall, you know, Obama actually called the Chinese a free rider in the Middle East. And so in that context, what is the, what, what, what possible incentive is there for the Chinese to actually you know, step in and take on a more leading role? They won't do that unless, they, unless the circumstances change. So that's the context that I would say for now. I would also say that you know, this, this position of China you know, wanting to avoid getting, you know, getting involved in political entanglements, this uh, is related to its, uh, you know, its, 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 its commitment to the principles of the five principles of coexistence in which it emphasizes non-intervention, non-interference in foreign affairs. Well, that's actually, you know, sometimes, you know, um, more ex uh, obeyed in the breach. Um, you find that the Chinese maybe ex exploit that position a little bit more closer to home, but in the context of the Middle East, you know, it is less, it is less in their interests to get involved in the politics and conflicts that are taking place there. So usually they try to step back. Now, of course, this may well change in the future. Um, you know, 
the nature of economic the nature of china's economic growth and its expansion into the region has meant you know growing trade and investment beyond uh, the energy sector you know into renewables uh, in parts of the gulf in in technology transfer when it comes to to israel for example and so what you are now seeing is an is a, is a, is a thickening of the economic relationship that china has with the region that is going to make it much more difficult to extract it out as well um I, now, if I can just sort of segue kind of awkwardly into sort of the wider historical context, you know, it, China's, you know, anathema towards political commitments, towards, you know, involvement in security issues in China, in, in the Middle East, is actually very much in contrast to what happened back in the 50s and 60s. If we go back to that period, China was a pygmy, okay, it was the, the it was, the, it was the junior partner to the Soviet Union. Um, of course, there was tension, you know, obviously the Sino-Soviet rivalry and tensions, especially after Stalin's death and, you know, China's view, especially under Mao, of seeing Khrushchev as a bit of a revisionist, uh, always competition with the Soviets. And in that context, you've got to see China's entry into the Middle East as a space to try and compete with the Soviet Union, but also in the context of the Cold War that was happening there at the time. Uh, and what was interesting is, of course, China comes in with very few economic ties at the time. So the relationship is much thinner. Uh, it is looking to cultivate, you know, relationships there. Uh, it is also in a, in a difficult situation because men, because the Soviet Union has got there first. And as the bigger power, most power, most region, regional regimes want to do business with either Moscow or Washington. Um, so what you see is the Chinese actually reaching out to uh, you know, uh, nationalist movements, uh, Latin liberation movements like the PLO in Palestine, the FLN in Algeria, in Eritrea, the, 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 the Eritrean uh, liberation movement there, and in the Gulf, the Dafaris. Um, and so what you actually see is a very activist policy, um, sort of the cultivation of these ties, and actually and a provision of military assistance, albeit quite small at the time, um, and so you see a political relationship that China has with these actors. Um, it is one that you know, actually starts to dissipate by the late 1960s, um, as China starts to cultivate and build diplomatic relations in the region, having those relationships with insurgent groups is somewhat awkward. So you see the Chinese moving into development of diplomatic relations. And from after Mao's death and from about 1978, you see the reversal of politics um, and economics shifted so that economic development becomes key and foreign policy, Chinese foreign policy becomes in the service of economic development. Um, so through the 1980s, you see, you know, economic growth in China. Of course, that needs to be fueled, but that has, that has to be fueled by something. It requires energy. And it's actually in 1993 that you see China finally become an energy importer for the first time. That's when the Middle East really matters. Um, until that point, most economic exchange was actually in the basis of the arms trade. So, you know, during the 1980s, the Iran-Iraq war, China made a massive fortune in selling to both sides. And this is where you know, economic business, commercial relations, you know, show that we can benefit from working with both sides and not taking a political position. And you may see that origin then. I think what's interesting is that, of course, during this time, of course, the Chinese are not, you know, are rising, are growing. But they have not reached a point where they are presenting a challenge to, to, the, to, to, to the regional order or the global order. Uh, during this period as well, from the period of 1978, under Deng Xiaoping, under Ji, Ji, uh, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, they maintain the China, Chinese foreign policy is to, is to emphasize its, quote, peaceful rise. It does not want to confront and challenge the United States, certainly not in the context of you know, uh, the post-Cold War world when the United States is preeminent, as you pointed out, Barra. Um, but from after 2000, you know, we can't deny China's economic position. We can't deny, you know, the, 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 the influence that the Chinese have. And so it becomes a little bit more tense. I think also there's changes taking place within China, especially in the wake of the financial crisis. Um, you see the West, you know, unable to exercise the same degree of influence that it had in the region. Um, but also in China, there is a political shift. In 2012, 2012, Xi Jinping comes to power. And it's actually under him that you have started to see a move away from this peaceful rise to a much more assertive approach. This sense that China hasn't, isn't on the rise anymore. China has risen. China therefore has a position and a role to take. 
Um, and that is where something like the Belt and Road Initiative you know, comes into play. Actually, the Belt and Road Initiative is not primarily geared towards the Middle East. It actually has its origins in the development of the, the Chinese periphery, you know, the western reaches of Xinjiang in the, in, in the far west and to the south in the, in the, in the, in the lesser developed provinces of Guilin um, and, and Yunnan, which also border, you know, uh, places like Vietnam. The idea was to, to cultivate and develop and build those, those, those areas up and then to build the near abroad. So you're thinking about Central Asia, you're thinking about South, um, sort of South, Southeast Asia. These are places where China wants to build markets. So this is where the Belt and Road Initiative was designed to you know, facilitate that um, through the, in, through the uh, use of Chinese capital surplus into the region. Um, that has slowly progressed you know, to the Middle East and then and now into Europe as well. So, and, and the interesting thing about the, the Belt and Road Initiative, there is no, I mean, some people have questioned whether there is a, an agenda here. Um, Chinese officials and scholars are very keen to say that there is none, that it's, uh, that it's, that there's, that it's open-ended, that every, pol every any, any partner can participate if they so want. Um, and of course that has generated a lot of interest in the Middle East, all countries in the Middle East want to participate. But of course, you know, we need to keep in mind that, you know, not all parties are equal. Um, you know, given the nature of the Middle East today, some of which are caught in the middle of conflict, uh, like Syria and Libya and Yemen, uh, others were like the Gulf, which are wealthier and more politically stable, it actually makes more sense for the Chinese to go to those more stable places. So you actually see in the Middle East today, Chinese relations being, um, you know, more intense and thicker in the Arab Gulf but also in Israel and, and to a certain extent as well with Iran and in North Africa with Egypt and Algeria. And you can actually see this in the nature of the, the partnerships that China has signed. So it has almost a hierarchy of partnerships, um, you know, and the, the, most, the ones that it has the deepest relationship with, it calls comprehensive strategic partnerships. And it has them with Saudi Arabia, Iran, the UAE, Egypt, Algeria, um, and if memory serves me, I also believe that they have what they call an innovation or technology partnership with, with Israel. So these are the places, the sites that matter to, 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 to China. Um, I guess, you know, sort of, I, I mean, I, I'm, I would probably say that I have probably reached the point that I wanted to say, I've kind of glossed over quite a bit, but in, in the nature of these things that, that often is the case, I would probably say, um, Looking ahead, what does this all mean? Um, hedging has been the, you know, that has, has worked very well for the Chinese until now. Of course, the question then is now, is this going to last into the future? Well, a number of factors will determine that, I think. Um, one, obviously, is, you know, what happens if, if the Middle East itself starts to settle down and we start to have less of this, you know, uh, com competition taking place between different states and the settlement into some clear, defined, you know, strategic alliances, presumably, for example, Saudi Arabia and the UAE and Israel on one side, and maybe Turkey and Iran on the other, then we might start to see, you know, the Chinese being forced to make a choice here. We also will see, I think, when it comes to Belt and Road, that, you know, when, uh, as it starts, I mean, a lot, of, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, sort of China's expansion. But what's interesting is that a lot of the literature, a lot of the commentary reached a peak in around 2018, 2019. But actually, if you look at the data, the numbers show that Chinese investments, Chinese, you know, Chinese, China, Chinese flows into the region peaked in 2018, and they've been on a slightly declining trajectory. So what this now means is that there's fewer resources. So that's going to mean greater competition, you know, amongst the different actors in, in, in the Middle East for those resources. That may well lead to China being sucked in and drawn into uh, making choices, which it has until this point managed to avoid. Um, finally, there's another thing that's, that's, that's I think, coming, that's, that's worth watching, that's on the back burner. Um, China, I think, has become aware that the region is, uh, you know, conflict prone. And while it has been able to navigate it, it realizes it may not be able to do this for much longer. And so what you're starting to see, not so much from the government itself, but from some of the scholars, the, you know, the, the Middle East researchers you know, in, the, in the Chinese firmament, the firmament, they are starting to talk about well, what can China do to try and contribute to the, the, the lessening of conflict. That has given rise to something called the peace through development uh, paradigm, and, and which, in which they're basically trying to 
a lot of this is kind of post facto. So it's kind of, it's, it's looking at what's already out there and trying to use what's out there, you know, it, manipulate it in a different way. So what they say is that, look, Belton Road is about developing, you know, sort of building infrastructure, it's about developing markets. It, if this goes ahead, then this can actually reduce the, the sources of conflict and the grievances that exist within societies, because you will, uh, implicit in this is follow the Chinese model of development, right? Economic growth will lead to greater prosperity, which will mean that, you know, frustration, political grievances uh, will diminish. And this seems to be the idea that seems to be starting to gain um, some attention in the Middle East, sorry, in, in, in Beijing, as to how best to apply this in, in, in the Middle East. Um, and you've seen, for example, you know, efforts to try and bring uh, different, you know, act, different regional actors together. So, for example, at the end of 2019, China hosted a Middle East security forum, thinking that, yes, dialogue is the best way forward. This is the solution. If you can just talk out your problems, then we, then, then we can move, move, we can get beyond them. I think this does also demonstrate a certain degree of naivety at, the, at this particular point. But it is, I mean, certainly as China becomes more and more invested and more and more forced to make choices, it may well have to, you know, up its game. And I will end it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Guy, too, for this uh, very interesting and, and rational also approach to China and the fact that every step also has an intention that makes sense, I would say, uh, behind it. So based on this, uh, and if participants want to ask questions, please do. But to both of you, actually, I have a question because up to now, I mean, we've been mentioning the US and its aims. Uh, Russia also and its aims, then China and its aims. And it sounds to me as if we were, the three of us, talking about three countries that head towards favoring their interests without any notion of cooperation that would be behind it. Well, if I bring it again to the system of international relations and the interest of the one or the others, I was mentioning before 1956, the Swiss crisis and how the US and the USSR were, that were rivals still put that work hand in hand actually to exclude the ones that were a bit annoying for them in the regional or international evolutions. Here, if each of you brings it to the other country that you talked about, if Adlen you bring Russia to China, and if Guy you be you bring China to Russia, what can you say about the notion of potential cooperation? I mean, basically, be it when it comes because we know that the relations with the U.S. are not at their best when it comes to the two countries, especially now with all the, I would say, the tension that we have, at least from an, uh, a rhetorical point of view. Uh, do you think that Russia and China could work hand in hand also believing that they could pave the way also to having more, more of their interests being defended, being in the manner strategy or the, in their foreign policy for what relates to the foreign policy in general? No one, if you, uh, Adlen, you want to start? Uh, yes, I can start. I, I, I think the, the, the question is very interesting. I think that uh, ideologically or politically, um, um, I can hardly see the differences between the two. I think the difference is in, the, I mean, the, the, difference, uh, the difference concerns the tools they use. Uh, if I had to compare the two, Russia and China, and, and that's why I think that co cooperation between the two is, of course, um, necessary. Uh, I would say that, I mean, uh, they, they share the same main point of view that alliances are bad and they, 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 they uh, and, and partnerships with every actor of the region is a better solution. But the tools are not the same. I think that China relies on, on economy because it is, because it is, uh, I mean, economically much uh, powerful than Russia, and, and and Russia has, I mean, has two tools that that, that China uh, doesn't use. I mean, and major tools, I would say, hard power and soft power, actually, because I I, I don't want to to, to insult our, our, our Chinese comrades, but I don't think that China is 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 uh, is, uh, is is very good in in this field. Russia, I mean, is, is improving in, 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 in both hard power and soft power. Hard power because the, the Russian victory in Syria is now obvious and it 
triggered some respect from other partners and uh, and soft power I, I, I would say uh, I, would, I would focus on on media because uh, Russian media are a very important tool to, to Russian diplomacy. And I think that yes, I mean in some respects they could cooperate because they have same goals with different tools. Uh, China, rather economy, and, and, and Russia, hard and soft power, let's say. Thank you. Thank you, Baron. Thank you, Adeline. That's a, a good a good starting point because um, the you know, I mean, there in some some ways they, they are both they both are quite similar, you know, relatively authoritarian, um, you know, having backed you know authoritarian regimes. Um, at the same time, they, they also, there's also a certain degree of competition between them. And this is actually, I mean, it's a great question because it's actually something I was looking at in myself uh, for, and, and, work, and presenting on and working on you know, about a year or so ago, which was, you know, where are the points of you know, commonality in terms of working together, like broader regional cooperation? And to be honest with you, I couldn't really find that much. I mean, they, they, they work, it's, it's very much working on individual files rather than sort of trying to you know, build you know, a common approach in all of this. Um, that said, I think the, you know, sort of, there is of course, keep in mind, I mean, you know, what, what Adeline has just said, there is you know, a tension between the fact that, you know, the Chinese are economically, economically preponderant and, pre and they, will, they will continue to be a dominant power economic power over the next couple of decades. You know, Russia, yes, it has won in the middle in the Middle East and in Syria, but you know, a lot of this has also masks its its uh, its wider long-term economic um, vulnerability and and decline. Um, you know, it is under it's facing a lot of pressure from from sanctions. Um, you know, sort of beyond you know it's it beyond sort of energy hydrocarbon wealth. You know, what else is there? So you know, there is. There is actually maybe sort of China, you know, Russia's done well in the short term, but the, you know, the long term, it's going to lose out in, in the bigger picture to the Chinese. Now, also keep in mind in the context of Syria specifically, I think that's been really interesting because what you actually see is the Chinese, you know, sort of quietly behind Russia and a lot of a lot of things. Um, you know, it has supported Assad. I mean, its position is that, you know, Assad is the, the legitimate government. Um, but rather than, you know, sort of put itself out in front, it has allowed Russia to take the lead. If you go back to the early part, pre-2015, um, the vetoes that were took that, you know, both Russia and China would veto a number of UN Security Council resolutions. But it was always the Russians who were sort of front and center and seemed to be quite happy with that. The Chinese kind of let themselves be sort of to the side. Um, I think what's really interesting now that, you know, in this last couple of years that we've seen, you know, now discussion is moving on in Syria. There is a conversation about what comes next, right? I mean, Assad is not going to go away. Um, now, the problem is that, the two, that Assad's two main, you know, international partners, Russia and Iran, are not in a position to help him reconstruct the country. I mean, you know, the world... I mean, the World Bank figures you know, keep going up every year, um, but I think in 2017, it was something like 240 million billion. Um, you know, dollars is needed for to rebuild the country. Um, and in the absence of that, where is that money going to come from? Certainly no capital in Syria for that, not from the Russians or the Iranians. And so you have seen the China, the, the, the Syrian government regime, um, you know, talking very favorably and, try, and trying to encourage Chinese investment, you know, have waiving contracts to the Chinese to come in and do, do business. Um, but the Chinese haven't really taken the bait What's, this was really interesting because on the one hand, the Chinese you know, have been very happy to let you know, the Syrians and whoever else, you know, in Libya, the same thing has happened with both, you know, until, until recently, the two governments both trying to attract Chinese interest. Um, and, and it looks good for the Chinese. They don't have to say anything, but, you know, others are talking them up. So, you know, there's, so there, and, and I think, you know, that there may well re, you know, generate resentment on the parts of the Russians and the Iranians who have done the heavy lifting who have actually invested, you know, um, you know, capital in terms of both finances and troops and materiel into Syria to then see the Chinese swoop in and take over, you know, take, take you know, win up and take over all these contracts. I think there is a certain degree of tension there, and yet it's also maybe wishful thinking that the Syrians expect the Chinese to come in and do this. 
Great, thank you very much. I don't know, I think that we reached actually the end of our time. It's, it really went very, very fast. So, I mean, I just want to, to thank you very much actually for your really very invaluable insights on the matter. And I definitely hope that we will keep on actually exchanging, debating. I encourage everybody also to follow on your, to follow your work. We took good notes, Guy, of this publication, China and the Middle East conflicts that, we, that, that you show. So thank you very much. Once once again to, to both of you and keep in touch and hope to see you very soon. And thanks also for Middle East Dialogue and for all the people that have been watching us also. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. You bye bye. Ciao. Thank you. Bye.